Okay. Okay, so the x-ray machine, so we'll talk a little bit more about what's happening inside the x-ray machine and then um, what influences quality. Um, and so that has a couple different elements to it. And then attenuation at the very end, um, sort of how the image is, um, it, it starts to show up on the actual sensor. And then we talk even more about what affects the picture, like I think next week, or no, next week's biology, I think. Um, radiation biology. So it might be weeks after the exam, I think we might go into that, like contrast and density and those types of things. So, um, oops, hold on, sorry. I'm in the wrong slide deck on my end over here. Okay, so just to review, so the production of x-rays, so what are the characteristics of an x-ray photon? So what are some of the things that you remember from last week, some of the characters. No mass, no, mass, no charge. Oh, speed of light, speed of light yeah. Ionizing. Mm -hmm. Ionizing, yep. Good. Those are the, those are some big ones. There's quite a long list. Some things have to do with, um, so x-rays travel in waves and have short waves, length and high frequency. So on that, um, that sort of thing that shows things that are longer wavelengths with a lower frequency and then as it gets higher and higher. So we're on the ionizing end with a little bit higher frequency and the shorter wavelength. Um, x-rays travel in a straight line, but they can be deflected. So in general, they'll just keep going. But if they hit something, they can be deflected. Um, x-rays cannot be focused to a point. So um, this is a little bit of a tricky concept, but you can't, uh, when you when you emit a ray of x-rays, they can never be like a laser beam, even though they go in a straight line, but they diffuse. So the easiest way to think of it is a flashlight and a beam of light. It just diffuses. So the farther away from it, it spreads out over a bigger and bigger area. And closer to the source, it's tighter and brighter and um, um, closer together. Um, X-rays are absorbed by matter. And then the absorption depends on a couple of different um, things that we'll talk about. And then X-rays interact with materials that they penetrate and they do cause ionization. Some other things on that summary list, X-rays can cause um, substances to fluoresce. So that was some of the, what caused Rankin to even discover it in the first place as you saw that um, sheet kind of glowing in the corner of the laboratory. Um, they caught, they produce an image on the sensor. They do have an, a biological effect on living cells. So they do cause biological changes. And then um, we know we need electrons. Oh, wait, that might be my answer to my next one. So what conditions are necessary for x-ray production? Yeah, we know we need mm -hmm, focusing the, mm -hmm, the electron, the high voltage, and stopping, mm -hmm, and then the abrupt stoppage, something to stop them. Um, when you turn on the x, I keep going to my answers and so the questions. So what happens when I turn the x-ray machine on? What's the first thing that starts to happen? You just turn it on in the room. Yeah, you get um, yep, the um, thermionic emission or the electron cloud starts forming around the tungsten filament. And then what happens when you actually hit the exposure button? Yeah, then you get that high voltage and you're accelerating the electrons across. Good. Good, you guys got it. Um, last year, I did. I had kind of, and maybe, it, oh, I guess I could have done it at the end of today, but I don't think we're going to have time anyways. But I had everybody like hold up a sign of the different parts and you had to put yourself in order. So it helped you think of the whole flow once we go through some of these extra steps. So maybe we'll do that as a review um, in the next week or so. Um, okay, so some of the things, some of the questions for today that um, we might be hopefully finding the answer to as we go through the PowerPoint are, how are the electrical currents produced? Some basic, I am not an electrician, you guys, but um, some basic things to understand about um, current and voltage and where does the heat go? And so what happens with the heat? 
And then how do the x-rays interact with human tissue? And so we just going to start to talk about the couple options that can happen once that x-ray photon comes out of the machine and then starts to interact with matter. So let's start to talk about that. Um, and then these are the objectives. We're going to describe direct and alternating current and how it relates to the x-ray machine. So a little electrical topic there. Discuss the function of the step up and step down transformer. This is um, an area that is all uh, questions like this will definitely be on quiz or exam. So understanding the step up and step down. Um, so I'll try to make that pretty clear. List factors influencing the x-ray beam size and intensity. And then explain factors affecting x-ray quality and quantity. So what what gives you more X-ray photons and what gives you better quality X-ray photons? And then define types of radiation, describe the process and identify how each would appear on the film. Um, eh, that's how each would appear on the film. I'm not so sure that we really focus on that. I might, I might take that one out. Oops, I wasn't done, there was one more. And then identify factors that influence x-ray absorption. So we'll talk about those um, different things that will affect um, the x-ray. And who here who has taken um, a radiation course before remembers the inverse square law? <laughs> Nobody? Was that, oh, yes, I remember it, or no, no? Does the term... Does the term sound familiar? No. Who yeah. said yes? <laughs> so the term, so we're going to, so the, the inverse square law is like a mathematical formula that explains basically like how the x-ray beam reacts and how it diffuses. And, and the concept is not hard to understand. But some people like to try and play around with mathematical formulas because if you... And I, this long story short, I'm not a mathematician. I'm not a lot of things, but I'm not a mathematician. So I'm not going to make you guys do formulas. If anyone here loves math, you can do a, you can do the formula and you can look in the book, but it has a lot to do with the changing the length of your BID. So if you go from a longer to a shorter BID, how will that affect your MA, turning your, your power up and down? So there, but the thing about it is that we don't really, there are really no modern machines where you change MA. That's kind of an older thing on older machines. And also a lot of times you just get your machine and then your BID is so, you know, a certain length. A lot of times we prefer the longer ones, but you may work in an office that has a shorter BID. But that's what the inverse square law um, formula is. So when we get to that part, it's not even on the objectives, we're go we'll talk about it and try and understand the concept, but um, we won't do an actual formula and you won't be asked to do one on a quiz or an exam Would we be asked to do one on the, on board? the board so there is pro you know maybe an a possibility but it would be a multiple choice so you know there is possibly a, a possible chance that they might do it but not everybody gets the same questions on the national board so you know like a handful of you might get one question out of what 200 questions or 250 or 300 I can't remember how many the national board is big so they probably I can't imagine they'd ask more than one and if they did it's not going to sink your boat so um, it could be that they ask a formula question but I kind of doubt it I don't think that's a very practical question to ask um, but you're not the first person to have asked me that okay so we're going to review the um, x-ray tube the little glass um, vacuum sealed tube that's inside of the tube head. So we were kind of playing around with these terms last time, like, okay, so the, the big thing that you actually move around that has the BID coming out of it, that's your tube head. And inside is the x-ray tube that has the cathode and the anode. So you can kind of see how it's a little brown, it's small, you know, the size of a pencil or a pen. You can see it's kind of a little brownish. So that's the leaded glass. And then there's a little tiny window somewhere in there that is going to let the x-ray um, photons come out after the reaction has occurred. So yeah. How often do the 
heart rate looks like? I don't know. I would not think very often. Like I would think, you know, maybe because I've worked in offices who've uh-huh. had this, yeah, for like 20 years, but you're supposed to get them service. You're supposed to have people come out and check and do their calibrations or whatever they do. And I suppose it's totally possible something could malfunction. But in general, I think it, they probably last years, you know, a very long time. Um, so on this side over here, we have um, the cathode. This is going to be your focusing cup. And inside is the tungsten filament. So you can't really see it on this side, but you can, you know for sure this is the anode side because it kind of has a copper hue, right? It kind of looks like copper, the color of copper. So this is your copper stem. And then embedded in there is your tungsten target. Um, let's see. So here we have a schematic. And I'm going to can... So this is on the um, PowerPoint, but I'm going to hand out some sheets that you guys can. These are just, you can ignore the numbers, but you can fill in these areas so that you can actually uh, do a worksheet at home to help you memorize the different names of all the different things. So we kind of have um, the answer key is in the PowerPoint, but you can fill out the diagram um, at home later because I don't think we'll have time to do it in class. But here we have the whole x-ray tube head that houses the small um, tube and then all that's surrounding this whole area between the um, outside of the tube head and the um, just the tube is insulating oil. So it's all filled with an oil which also helps to absorb the heat. So here you can see the, the different parts. We have the tungsten filament and then the focusing cup here we have the electrons coming over to the target and they fly all around, but they get absorbed in the leaded glass and then they just come through here. Now we have a few other things here that we're going to learn about. There's a couple other pieces of the machine that we're going to learn about later in this slide deck, but they come through here and then they go down the BID and notice the BID, this says positioning, they're calling it a PID, but they're interchangeable. But um, this is also lead line. So the any x-ray beams that happen to kind of spread out perhaps farther will get absorbed in that. And then you'll just get what's coming down the tunnel that doesn't get absorbed anywhere else. You have the tungsten target over here. We have the copper stem that absorbs the heat. And then this is showing you here that we have the negative side for the cathode and the positive side for the anode. Um, the outside is the metal housing, you can see that um, in the rooms and then the BID. So these, these things here that we're gonna get into a little bit more detail, we have an aluminum disc that, so if you look down the barrel of the BID, if you go into the room and look down and say, what's down in there? You'll just see metal. And that's the aluminum fil filtration disc. And we'll talk about what that does specifically in a little bit, but that's what you're looking at. And then there's also another thing that's called the lead collimator, and it's basically a donut. So it's a it's a donut shaped, you know, um, cir circular or triangle, a rectangle, depending on what kind of a unit you have. And there's a hole in the center, so it focuses even more the beam that's uh, allowed to come out of that tube. Um, so it collimates it or it, or it shrinks it down because the lead's going to absorb. It won't be able to go through there. It can only go through the center of the collimator. So there's two more sort of devices that manipulate the shape and size of the beam before it gets out of the machine. So if you go into the x-ray room and you just take the tube head and you look down the length of the BID and you just look down into the machine, mm -hmm. you'll see it. That's the aluminum disc. Okay. And um, because it's, there's, yeah, it just looks like it ends, but that's, you're looking at the filter, the aluminum filter. Yeah. The collimator, the lead collimator is the one that shaped like a donut if it's a round BID and if it's rectangle, obviously it's rectangle shape, but if it has a hole in the center and that's the only place that your final primary beam can escape from, it, everything else, will prevent excess, it controls the shape basically of your primary beam. So it, if it's a round BID, it's shaped like a donut with a hole in the middle. And if it's rectangle, then it's rectangular with a hole in the middle. And we'll go back to that. We'll go back, that's just kind of an overview, but we'll go back to that. Okay, so for electricity, 
um, let me move my thing out of my notes so I make sure I say all the things right. So an electrical current current is a flow of electrons. So that's what's happening is this flow of electrons in a wire or a circuit um, coming out from the wall. It's, you know, obviously the source is like the 110 or 220 um, plug in from the wall, depending on how much um, voltage you're looking for, or how much you how much voltage you need for whatever you're running. But that's what it is, is electrons running up and down a wire. And then you have DC, which is direct current, which means the electrons just flow in one nonstop direction. Direct current, they're just going in one, one way. Alternating current, or AC, they flow back and forth. So there's a pause. So you have, and there's a picture on the next slide, I think that shows it, but all the, the electrons travel in one direction and then they stop and then they go reverse and go in the opposite direction. And um, the currents from a typical wall outlet is an alternate alternating current or AC. That's what we have from our typical. And DC or direct current means that the electrons only go in one direction. But for most of our, our plugins, they're AC, so they're alternating current, which essentially means that you're getting your electricity in pulses. That essentially, because it, it goes up and then it comes down and it goes up and it happens very rapidly, but that um, basically means that you're getting your electricity in pulses. So here's a little diagram of it. So this is showing the how you would how it would affect how you would actually end up getting your x-ray so because it's in pulses you get like with the one pulse you get some x-rays released and then there's no x-rays and then x-rays released and then no x-rays but this happens so fast this happens 60 times in one second so i mean it's like incredibly fast but if you slow it down then that's what's happening is there's little pauses so you're getting your x-rays no x-rays x-rays no x-rays and that's because of the flow of the electrons in the in the wire. Mm -hmm. So this is before this before we talked about. Yes. Yeah, so this is well. Actually, no. This kind of happens mm -hmm. when you push the button, but it's because of the type of electricity that's coming from the wall. So when you actually are making it, it's because the you have AC. Um, but that type of um, electricity coming from your wall, then when you actually push the button, it's still happening in pulses, but it happens so fast that it's like a direct beam. Um, but yeah, did that make sense? Yeah, I'm just wondering if it was, if it was like, uh, just like after the electricity slows down and it's breaking and the wavelength after it's breaking. You guys have such good questions. Um, let me but think about that. I know it's like once you know, so the, so the voltage from, so you're actually, and we talk a little bit more about what happens with the voltage because it changes from like, it's not just directly from the wall and then a smooth direct line to the x-ray. There's something that happens with the transformers. Um, but basically, you know, you're getting this, this alternating current from the wall and that's available. But I think because it all happens so fast, it almost seems like a steady process, you know? So I don't but think it's like, separate. It's mm -hmm. separate well, I, it, I, you know, that's actually a really good question. I'm actually not sure. Like I, I'm pretty sure that when you push the button in with producing the x-rays you're you're getting a pulsing but it happens 60 times in a second so it's not like you'd ever notice or something it's just the way it's actually working on an electrical level and thank goodness we don't have to you guys are just really curious and your minds are so nice and out, like, yeah the whole new concept, or do I have to connect it to other like, oh like the production like characteristic and Brenstrelong yes no so this is not a different yeah that's a good question so no the the way um the the way the x-rays are made the different types of x-rays that are produced those are separate this is going to happen in every machine and this is because of the kind of um, electricity that we get from the wall. And this is just the process of how the electricity works in the machine and what happens. But it does, it's different from the kind of radiation that's produced. Yeah, separate things, separate things, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have been actually that the 
I think because, I mean, and this is probably a question for an electrician, but I think it's because, so, so don't, I, I probably not, I'm not going to say that I'm answering this 100% right, but it's, I think it's because it dips down for whatever reason, like it doesn't just stop at, at zero and it dips down and I think it might be because it's going in the opposite direction. So it's heading, so it's like it's going positive, it's going negative. It's, it doesn't stop at zero. It like crosses the zero threshold and goes negative. And and that might be all I can say on the matter. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. So, and, and that does have to do with, I think, the flow, you know, the difference between the... Um, well, no, I'm just going to stop there because I, now I'm speculating. I don't want to speculate. That's all I know on the matter. <laughs> okay, so power and supply. So here we go. So here's there's two circuits necessary for production of x-rays in the x-ray tube head. So we have the filament circuit that we know is the tungsten filament. So that's necessary. And it provides a source of electrons when it gets heated up. So that's our source of electrons. Um, but it only needs a very, very small amount of voltage to warm up and produce electrons. It doesn't need a lot. So there's 110 volts coming out of the wall and it doesn't need anywhere near as that. It only needs three to five volts. And this, this um, rate of energy that it's required is controlled by MA, so the milliamperage. So when you have um, on your machine and it says seven milliamperage, you know, that's one setting, some older machines might have said 15 MAs, that's obviously higher. So it, you know, it would have maybe heated it up more and you would have gotten more electrons. But this is all it is required um, for, for the filament to heat up and to get accessible electrons is somewhere between three to five. So it has to do something, it has to change that 110 volts down and will that's where the transformers come in. Um, and it's called, because it's going and down, this is kind of, a, you can kind of follow the logic here, because you're reducing from 110 at the wall when you plugged it in at the wall, because you're reducing it down to three to five, they can call it a step down transformer. Yeah. So is this what is heating up the copper? The tungsten. So this is what's heating up the tungsten filament mm -hmm. on the cathode side. So this is what's heating up the tungsten filament on the cathode side. Your step down transformer is going to reduce the voltage that's coming out of the wall to three to five volts so that your, your filament can heat up. So then the next thing we know that when we push the button, we know we need those high uh, voltage, we need the high power to accelerate the electrons across to the anode. So a high voltage circuit provides voltage required to accelerate electrons to the anode at high speed. And you need much more than 110 volts. You need 65 to 100,000 volts. So that's way, way, way more than 110 coming out of the wall. So because you're going from 110 coming out of your wall to 65 or 100,000 kilovolts, you need a step up transformer. And then there's an auto transformer. And all you really need to know about that is that it basically just gives, it, it kind of evens everything out and keeps everything from short circuiting. It makes up for extreme variations that might pop a breaker or make the lights dim, you know, like, you know, so it's kind of like the safety mechanism. It just kind of keeps everything in balance. And I'm sure there's more to it, but that's all you got to know. So the auto transformer prevents short circuiting um, or breaking the, popping the breaker. I do have a lot of notes here in the side. You can, when you pull up the PowerPoints, you can read through it. Um, I don't wanna just read through all my notes, but you can in case I've, sometimes I highlight something in there that um, is pertinent. So always read through my side notes. Those are always helpful. And sometimes I'm just saying it a different way or, you know. So but, you're not, all the, uh, so on the yeah on that slide the notes have like talking points that I would say 
and I usually just say it differently once I'm up here. But that's what, but read through it because sometimes it has a nice, I don't mean I say it different as in like totally different, but you know, I just use different phrasing or I might, you know, but just read through it because it's, um, it gives, um, sometimes it, it might be clear if you can actually read it too, as opposed to hearing me. Mm -hmm. Oh, do both, <laughs> steady both, <laughs> steady both. Okay. Yeah, they're both good. They they go they should go hand in hand. Okay, so transformer coil, a transformer has two so so the step up and step down transformers are um basically a little unit that has two sets of coils on them. Um there's the primary coil and then there's the secondary coil. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm trying to Yes, voltage. Voltage. Yeah, so it's in the step, the transformer takes those that voltage from the wall and will either increase it or decrease it. Okay. So it'll, yeah, it'll decrease it to three to five for the tungsten filament side and it'll increase it for the accelerating the electron. Yeah, so the transformer has two sets of coils and um, there, when there are more turns in the primary coil, so there's a primary and a secondary coil, when there are more turns, and by turn, I mean, these little things. This should be, yeah, I think there's a little bit of two and a little bit of five. And so, because remember I put this new addition, they've kind of switched some things around. Um, and so there's a sum of, two, that's why when I told you guys at, at first, I said, oh, the quiz will be over chapter two. And then I was like, no, the quiz is over just the PowerPoint from week two, because there is a little bit of information still in chapter two. So when, so say this is like a little box, like, so you can imagine this is a box. If we call this the primary and this the secondary, so when the primary, so let me make sure I'm reading it right. When there are more turns, well, but we gotta do it this way. When there are more turns in the primary coil than the secondary coil, then it is, um, the secondary voltage will be reduced. So that means that if we start out with more and we go to fewer turns, it's gonna step down. It's gonna, it's gonna reduce. And then if we reverse it, if the primary coil has more and the secondary has, the primary has fewer and the secondary has more, then we're gonna increase voltage. So, and there's another picture up here on the PowerPoint that will help that too. What's that? Yes, I will repeat it. And there's a couple more slides that will kind of reiterate it. Um, okay, so so yes, yeah, so just to say it again, when there are more turns in the primary coil than the secondary um, coil, voltage will be reduced. So the first one, I can't, I wish I had could have my both things up at the same time. So if there's more turns in the primary um, and less in the secondary, we're going to go from you can just think more to less, up to down. We're going to reduce because we're there's fewer turns. So when there's fewer turns in the secondary, we're going to reduce. When there are fewer turns in the primary and the secondary has more turns, we're going to increase the voltage. And I like the picture that's coming up because it'll show it a little bit better. So we'll look here. So here we have a couple here. So step down transformer, um, step down transformer here. This is a picture of it. Heats the filament um, circuit. So it heats the tungsten filament. They're kind of repeating what it does. It heats up, makes an electron cloud. It is controlled by MA. So that is, that's what controls the, the power part of it. Fewer turns in the secondary coil um, than the primary. And that's part of why it goes down because there's fewer, there's fewer coils. And then it decreases from 110 to three to five. So this guy over here where the red arrow is pointing, there's more turns in the primary, fewer turns in the secondary. Because of that, this is, this is the step down and it decreases voltage. And this is on the um, cathode side. It's where your tungsten filament is. It's controlled by MA. 
all of those points are like important bullet points. Those are all important bullet points to know. This shows the auto transformer, but I just don't feel like the auto transformer is easily, like maybe somebody else, like an electrician might be able to kind of show it in a picture. They they put a couple um, figures in the book with the auto transformer, but I just don't feel like it's as easily to explain because they have it connected to different things. And all you, for, for testing purposes, you just need to know that it sort of stabilizes it. Yeah. So would you say that the cathode part is before the cathode takes up the um, point filament? Yes, yeah. So it's gonna run your electricity is gonna run through this transformer before it gets the filament. Okay. Yeah, good question. Mm hmm Okay, so now the step up, so now we have the red arrow pointing over here to the step up. The, this is controlled um, by the by kilovoltage. So this is your high voltage um, circuit, the, the step up transformer. There are more turns in the secondary coil. So we know that it's the um, voltage is going to increase. And then it goes from the 110 in the wall to um, the 65 to 100,000 volts. Well, it's volts and it's controlled by the kilo by the kilo voltage. And you don't need to know that that's okay. You don't need to know that part. So it's controlled by the kilo voltage, just like the other one is controlled by MA. Those are I don't know who said that that question to was that you. Um I don't just like um it's on the machine, so you know, this machine functions at 70. Like you can go out and look at ours and it'll say 65 or 70. You can actually change two of them. So you can change that setting. Um, and then the MA you can't change. Um, but this is actually the transformers are actually just affecting the voltage from the wall, either increasing it or decreasing it. So step up um, affects the, um, that's when you push the button and you want to accelerate the electrons. Um, and so when you push the button, it's going to send that, that electricity through the step up transformer to increase the voltage to get those electrons to fly over to the anode and make an X-ray beam. Um, and then if you, and then just knowing these coils, um, is very because there will be a question about your primary coil has fewer turns than your secondary coil. So then in it, you can draw an image. Like you can have a scratch paper and you can have your little thing and you're like, okay, here's a rectangle. Here's, there's fewer. It's like a math problem sort of. So it, sometimes it helps to write it out. So if you get it on a quiz or an exam, be like, okay, here's coils. And it's and the problem says that the secondary coil has more turns. So now I know I have to make more turns. It's like thinking in wavelengths, you know, um, short or long wavelengths. So if you draw it out and then just knowing that if you've gone from fewer to more, then you've gone up. If you've gone from more to fewer, then you've gone down in the voltage. So it's a pretty easy concept. You just have to get all those things straight in your head. And then the auto transformer gives the ability to alter kilovoltage um, of the x-ray machine, again, to like prevent, you know, lights from flickering or breakers from popping. And a single coil around an iron core serves as a primary and secondary coils. Um, that I don't even, I don't test you on that. So that's not a, that's kind of nice to know. I don't even, I probably don't even, sometimes I try to weed out the stuff that's really important. So you guys know what to really focus on, but. I don't, yeah, there's, there, the word auto transformer may be in a multiple choice, but what the answer we'll be looking for will be e either a step up or step down. So, uh, so knowing that the auto transformer is sort of just your equalizer, you know, that's all you really need to know, but you want to know the specifics about the step up and step down. Um, Okay, 
So here is just an image that sort of shows the, you, it, it kind of, I like, I think I just like this image because here it shows the high voltage or the step up um, on one side and then the step down on the other, but that's really all it shows. And it just labels all the other things. It's really similar diagram to what I'll hand you guys out. Um, but that's just what that slide is, kind of showing it again in a different way. And then here, so this takes a minute to kind of process because one thing that's a little bit tricky to kind of wrap your mind around is that the, the kilovoltage is connected to both sides but the MA or the step down transformer is just on the cathode side, but we actually have, you actually have a connection for the kilovoltage on the cathode and the anode. And so that's what it's showing in this, in this um, diagram here. So we have our step up transformer over here on the, um, over here on the anode side, but you can see how it's also has a line over here to this side and I, it just has something to do with accelerating them and getting them over to the anode. Um, but that's just what it's showing here is that we have the step up, which is connected on both. You can see how it's connected on both, but the step down, which is going from the, from the wall into the cathode side. So that's just coming in on this side. So it kind of shows you how they're connected and how they affect the little vacuum, the little glass tube. And I don't think there's a specific question on, like, is the kilovoltage connected to both? But I, there's not a question like that on a quiz. But just in case you were wondering, in case we were looking at this diagram going, why is the step up connected to both sides? And I think just that has something to do with having to actually get the x-rays across. But we are not tested on that. So in the big points to know is that kilovoltage is for the acceleration of the electron, the MA controls um, the cathode side with the heating of the filament. Let's see if there's anything else on this that I want to point out. Just line out. Yeah, that's, I was just thinking that's kind of interesting because so when you push, so you know when you are in the rooms, everyone who's had lab already, you know how there's the, well, but everyone saw this because we looked at them when we did our tour, but you know how there's the different pictures of the different teeth and you select, you either select an anterior or you select a molar or you select bite wings. What you're doing there is you're selecting the amount of time that X-ray is gonna be produced. So that's what that line in from timer has to do with. It's like, how long is this process gonna, these X-rays gonna be accelerated over to the anode? How long is that process gonna be? And so if you're shoot, you know, if you're taking a picture of an anterior tooth, it's gonna be a shorter period of time than if you're taking an X-ray of a molar. So that's what that. So that's just going for, and we don't change MA. So line in from the MA switch, but we don't we don't change MA. It's fixed. So that's not necessarily applicable to us. And the textbook says that most machines are not. You can't adjust MA on almost all machines nowadays. Yet another image here, and this one is kind of showing. So like here we have the X, the plug into the wall. Here we have the, um, oh my gosh, the word just escaped me, but the thing that would be up on the wall that you change all your stuff. <laughs> Somebody remind me what we called that. What did we call that? The control panel. Oh my gosh. So here, oh, it's right there on the picture. <laughs> You're brilliant. Um, I'm just like, sometimes too much data is like overwhelming right so so this is and this is kind of an old-fashioned looking one because obviously ours look different nowadays 
but this is going to be plugged into the wall. You're going to have your on and off switch. This is showing an auto transformer that clearly we don't they, don't, they don't look like this anymore. It looks a little bit different, but um, it does talk about the MA. We Ours do, does still say the MA and it does still say the um, KVP. So this is adjusting. This is actually, a, you can adjust. You can say, I want higher or lower MA, and then you can actually adjust the KVP. There's, we don't have machines that do quite this much anymore, but it at least gives you that um, explanation. And this would show you how many impulses you would get, you know, per whatever it is, second when you're holding down the button. And we choose it now by choosing like a little picture of a two. But it shows how from that um, control panel, it's connected to the high and the low, um, the low voltage. And then when you actually push the button, the reaction happens and then you get your x-rays. So that's sort of an, another diagram. It's just sort of an older setup. So not everything is applicable to what ours looks like today. And okay. So, he, so now we'll talk about quality and quantity of the x-ray beam. So how many um, X-ray photons are produced and then the quality of those X-ray photons. So we know MA or milliampere determines the number of photons in the beam. Why do you think it would affect the number of ultimate X-ray photons that you get? Yeah, so how many electrons are in your electron cloud? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's how you remember it. Is quality. That, and that is absolutely like what you it's like this that's what that KLM KLMN is. It's just another little trick that the textbook has. So whatever helps you remember MA quantity and then KVP or kilovolt um quality. And then you'll notice there's a little there's a little overlap, and so we'll talk about that. But that's why the quantity is affected by MA because that's heating up the filament, that's making the electron cloud. So that's going to um, have to do with how many available electrons. The kilovolt or the KVP determines the energy of each photon. So uh, higher KVP, um, higher energy um, X-ray photon ultimately, or lower energy. Um, uh, lesser, um, less energy in the, in the individual photons. So KLM, I tried to highlight, so, um, but K for quality, M for quantity, KLMN. But KVP can also influence quantity, and why do you think that might be? If you increase the KVP, you increase power, and what is KVP doing in the first place? It's sending it across. So if you have increased power, you just send it across faster. So if you just have a faster process, you'll have more X-ray photons. So KVP can affect quantity and quality, but MA is only quantity because it's only dealing with the number of available electrons. So then some other things that we will, that um, affect the quality um, is the distance. Um, oh, this is not explaining it. I think the next slide maybe explains it. So distance is um, the size of the beam. So what's the actual distance between where the beam is produced and whatever you're trying, your target. Um, rate is the exposure time. So that is, you know, going from exposing a shorter amount of time for an anterior tooth to a slightly longer time for a, if you're doing a molar. So that's going to also um, affect the quantity because it's how long is that beam being generated. And then exposure time. Oh, I already said that. Oh, wait. Exposure time also influences um, quantity. Rate is the exposure time. I feel like those are the same thing. Rate is the exposure time and exposure time. That's the same thing. Okay, we have an extra one in there. Take one of them away. And then all of these factors together pretty much um, are the beam intensity. So all of these things 
um, come together to create hopefully the most, the highest quality beam to get the best um, picture in the end. Yeah. Yeah, so basically, I think that is kind of confusing and I'm hoping it, we kind of clear it up here in a minute. Let me see if my notes have anything. But your the dis the distance for the size from when you um, produce them at the anode to wherever they're going to um, hit the matter on the other end, so that's going to affect the size of the beam because it diffuses. So if if it's a longer distance, then you're going to have a a larger well. That can be tricky because there's a couple factors that actually influence it. So. Your BID, when they're traveling in the BID, it kind of keeps them a little bit corralled. But when they um, they I mean, they start to move out even in the BID, but if they hit the inside of the BID, they get absorbed. So it's those ones that ultimately exit the end of the BID. Um, and so you kind of you kind of want a longer BID to help focus them that way. But that's sort of approaching on a different topic. So. I mean, yeah, we're talking about the useful beam. My I think it's just a test. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's just that. No, you're good. Um, okay, so let's see. Let me just run through here and make sure I didn't. Yeah, so that's what it's referring to is spreading out, the spreading out of the beam. And just see what my notes say here. Distance, the farther you are from the source of the beam, the beam spreads out, same number of photons, just in a larger field. So it absolutely does not affect quantity. It probably, it will affect quality. So it will, because you're you're not, at that point, you're not generating any more uh, um, photons. You just have what you have, and some of them are being absorbed as they go out. Um, and then, and then the, the farther distance, then it's going to spread out more, and you're going to get a more diffuse X-ray beam. So it will affect quality to some degree, but it's not going to affect quantity at all. Mm hmm. Okay. How are we doing on time? We are getting close. Okay, I think I got to speed it up. So here's another example of the distance here. This is just an image showing basically what's happening. So we have the target anode where the X-ray beam is generated, and then you can see how it diffuses. So we have a couple different, when, and we talk about this later too, when we're talking about the, um, some of the, the um, characteristics or the quality of the image, um, but you can see how there's a couple of different things we talk about the target surface distance. So the target being the source, like where it's generated and then the surface of whatever it hits first. So like the cheek or something like that. And then we talk about the target or another word is source. Sometimes in the PowerPoints, the word source might be there. Um, and then that's the distance to the object, which is what we're trying to look at our object of interest, like the tooth. And then again is the target or the source and the distance from that to the receptor. So all of those are going to affect the image. And we'll talk more about that later. You know, that's that has to do with how close the receptor and the tooth need to be, how close the patient and the target should be. And there's all kinds of things, but that's another PowerPoint. But this is a nice um, figure that kind of shows those separate things. Okay, relationship between exposure time and MA, both have a direct effect on the number of X-ray photons being produced in an X-ray beam because one is available extra electrons, the other one is how long it's producing them. Um, so MA or the milliampage per second um, is what is um, affecting that. Milliampage required for a given exposure time is inversely proportional to the exposure time. And this kind of goes into the inverse square a little bit, but basically if you have more exposure time, you can, ha you can have a lower MA. And if you have a higher MA, you can have a shorter exposure time because they're inversely related. But that's sort of just a nice to know point because you're not gonna change the MA. You, you'll change your exposure time, but you're not gonna change the MA. So it's all our machines and most machines that are out there are calibrated. You can only change it so much. You know, you can't change it willy nilly for whatever you want. You can only change it within a, a certain range. Um, 
Okay, so here's the inverse square law. So the intensity of radiation is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the source of the radiation, the source being the target or the, the anode, the, on the anode side. So inversely meaning as you get farther away, so as you go, you know, from, um, if it's, you know, twice as far, say you go from six, eight to 16, then you're going to get four times the diffusion because it's squared. So it's, it's not just one, but it's squared times, um, you know, with a little two up in there. So you get, so you get four times the diffusion. So it's going to spread out and be even, um, even more diffuse. And then if you go three times as far, then you can see it's one ninth, it's even more spread out. And if you go four times, it's even more. And there's a there's a fun video that shows like a piece of bread with butter and it shows, and every time they make, turn on, every time they expose it, they make a little beeping sound. And then four pieces, they go from one slice of bread that has really thick butter on it to then four slices of bread and you can see the butter is a little thinner and then it goes to nine pieces of bread and it's even thinner still and so it's just showing that it's widening by um squaring that those digits um and so it gets thinner and thinner but for me it's a more of just a visual thing you just i just know that what's happening is you're getting more and more diffuse the same number of photons are available they're just covering a much larger space. So what that means in real life is that if you're taking a picture of, um, you want a picture of, you know, a tooth and you're closer, you're going to get higher quality, more energy directed into the area that you want. Whereas if you spread out that, that space and the beam is allowed to diffuse, now you're going to cover more of their head, but that area that's covering what you want to see is weaker. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't want to see, you don't, you're not look, trying to look at the head, but now you have radiation weakly covering the head when all you want to see is tooth number 30. So you want to get to that, you want to be in the, the closer part of the beam or you want the, um, the shorter part of the beam so that you can really get it to right where you want it instead of weakly radiating their whole head, you want to strongly radiate what you want to see. So that's the gist of it. And um, there are, there is, in the book, they do give you um, an ability to basically test. You're changing the MA because you're changing the distance. There have you go from like an eight inch BID to a 16 inch, and then they change the MA. They go from, you know, seven or three or something like that to whatever it is, 12, because you're going to go four times as much. So Original density of mm -hmm. Yeah, and so you can you can put in numbers for that, and basically what you're just thinking of is changing the length of the BID. Mm -hmm. But we're not gonna we're not gonna so be tested on that. Any mm -mm. No, you're not gonna have you're not gonna be tested on a formula for inverse square. There are there there are good videos too. So here's like an example. Here's a video I've seen because they don't just talk about this in dental radiology, they talk about this in, you know, medical radiology. And so I have seen some videos where they explain it really, really good, but they use slightly different terms, or they may be talking about gray and sievert, which is a measurement of the radiation, which we do talk about, but they apply it differently than the MA. So it's almost like the more you search it out on YouTube, it can be a little bit helpful, but it also can be more just confusing. I was searching and searching for someone to just give a good example of like writing out the whole equation so that, but, and this, this video, I thought he did a good job, but it doesn't apply 100%. So that's why I'm just like, eh, we're just not gonna, we, I, you're just not going to get tested in it um, in this course. And then, like I said, I don't think it's a very highly tested part of the national board. Um, but understanding the concept, though, is, and you can understand the concept um, from just what we talked about. Um, okay, so here we have, so um, we want the best quality and quantity x-ray beam to expose the patient to. So we're trying to, even though 
we know that certain x-ray beams are going to give, they might damage, they might cause a little bit more damage. We want to make sure that we get the best image the first time. We don't want fog or anything like that. So we're, it's, we're willing to increase the, the power of the x-ray beam. So x-rays um, are measured in nanometers, which is a millionth of a millimeter, one billionth of an inch, so super tiny. And the useful beam ranges, um, the useful range of an x-ray in medicine and dentistry is like 0.01 to 0.05 nanometers. So we're talking super duper tiny, and that's just sort of um, nice to know information in the notes. But what you're looking for in general is you want shorter wavelengths, you want greater penetration, depending, especially if you have a larger patient um, with thicker muscle and denser bone, you want high energy, high frequency, and you want it to go through and be able to you know, reach the sensor and give you all the information that you want. So I really like this diagram down here because it sort of shows like say this is uh just say this is a tooth you know and these are all the atoms of the tooth so it shows the different penetration so if you have a weaker x-ray um beam it's going to come in and just not that far into the tooth it's going to get absorbed in you know it hits one of these atoms and and the beam the the photon gets absorbed if it's a medium powered or your KVP is a little higher and you can see the wavelengths are a little bit shorter. See how it gets a little bit farther in. And then if it's a really high quality, like the kind that we want, um, it's going to um, have a higher um, frequency and it's um, shorter wavelength still, and it's going to get all the way through. Now, this isn't just, that's not saying that every single x-ray is supposed to get through, every photon is supposed to get through because obviously they don't because we see white and gray and all these different you know, shades. Um, but we still, we want the ones that are, have the most potential to make it through because the ones that are gonna be stopped by amalgam or by dense bone are gonna be stopped anyways. But we still um, want the ones that are um, highest quality to do the job. Um, let's see. Okay, so selectively absorbing out useless lower energy photons. So we have a couple things that help us get rid of anything that would be weaker and just not be helpful or beneficial to the x-ray image at all, or that would cause fog or just be detrimental to the patient. Um, so we have stuff to help filter that out. And so the first thing is the aluminum filter, like I talked about in the beginning, it's just a disc of aluminum. Um, and then it's um, half, it's another term for that is the half value layer. And it's the thickness of, absor of absorbing material. It's typically aluminum. Um, necessary to reduce the intensity by half of the original value. So it basically takes out about half of all the photons that are just not necessary. They're ones that would never be very beneficial anyway. So they call it the half value layer. So it's going to take out all your weaker um, x-ray photons. And you can just see it kind of shows that here in the diagram. The lighter pink ones are just the weaker ones, and they just get absorbed in the aluminum filter. So a couple things to note about that is when it is um, below 69 kVp, it's going to have an aluminum filter that's a little bit thinner at one and a half millimeters. That is tiny. And you guys will, millimeters will be something you just know, like in your brain, you'll be able to think of millimeters because you'll be thinking in terms of millimeters when you measure around people's teeth and their sulcuses and their periodontal pockets. So you'll be thinking in terms of one, two, three, four, all the way up to like 12 millimeters. And then, um, so one and a half millimeters is like super tiny. So it's pretty thin. And so it doesn't take a thick piece of metal to absorb these um, weaker X-ray photons. If you have a machine that's 70 or higher, it's gonna be a little thicker and it'll be a two and a half millimeters. And so I think two of our machines are 65 and two of our machines can be either 65 or 70. So I'm assuming the ones that can be 70 have the thicker aluminum. Um, we used to, before we replaced them all, we just knew that we had the 1.5 for all of our machines, but we've replaced two, so. And that is located in the tube head before the BID. So the BID is the long tube sticking out. So that aluminum filter is at the start of the BID or right as you're exiting the tube head. 
Then we have that collimator that we talked about in the beginning. And you can see in a circular BID, it's shaped like a donut with a hole in the middle. Um, and then for a rectangle, here's a rectangular one, it's a rectangle shaped with a hole in the middle. And it just, again, it just reduces the size of the beam. So it um, um, has a, um, a lead, it's made out of lead and it just absorbs anything that goes around it. So it just reduces and kind of focuses the beam to the size you want, controls the shape and the size of the beam. That's covering that word a little bit. But both of those things are at the at the start of the BID. So you have your tube head, and then you have the aluminum filter and the collimator, and then you have your BID coming out. The lead is the collimator. Okay. So yeah, the, the filter that covers the whole opening is aluminum, and typically aluminum, and the collimator is lead. So here's just another kind of showing um, the image. It just shows how if you don't have, um, this kind of shows the difference between rectangle and circular because a circular um, BID, you just get more x-ray coverage on your patient. That's why you don't cone cut as easily because you just have bigger space. And then with a rectangle, it just shrinks it down and you're just covering a much smaller area just to cover the size of the sensor. Um, another image of the collimator. So if if it was a circular collimator or a circuit with a circular BID, all of this area radiation would come out. But with the um, rectangular collimator, it shrinks it way down um, to pretty much just a little bit more than the size of the sensor. So it it saves a lot of radiation for the patient. This is a really good thing when you're a student learning to take films because you can take a lot more films and you're still not over what like a typical FMX would be. Now our goal is to never take more than we need. So you don't wanna, you know, you don't necessarily wanna take, you know, like a normal set of 18 films. You don't wanna take, you know, like 10 more, like 28 films. <laughs> like that's not your goal, but you know that you have more leeway and you're not gonna be exposing the patient to necessarily more than what they would normally get in a given FMX. Um, so the patient receives about 50% less radiation. I know somewhere also, I I think I read 60 in the, so um, 50 to 60% less radiation when you use a rectangular collimator. Here's another image of that. I have to, I think I'm gonna end up running. I don't, I, we can't run um, late. So I'm gonna have to speed up my, I took too much time talking. Okay, so a couple things um, that we have to know when what's coming out of the x-ray head, we have the primary radiation or the useful beam or the primary beam. And then we have secondary ra radiation, which is created when the primary beam interacts with matter. So when it hits the cheek, when it hits the teeth, when it hits anything, um, whatever it hits, that um, is secondary radiation is, um, is created. And under that subheading, we have scatter. And that's a form of secondary radiation resulting from um, an X-ray photon that has been deflected from its path by the interaction with the matter. So I sort of feel like secondary and scatter sort of say the same thing. And scatter is basically a form of secondary radiation. Um, so what happens to the X-ray photon? So after they leave the tube, tube head, they can either pass through something like just completely and hit the sensor without having ever done anything, or they can be absorbed into the matter or they can scatter. And then once they scatter, then again, they have the opportunity to eventually be absorbed into something. Um, but those are the three things that can happen to, uh, to the to the radiation coming out of the tube head. So if there's no inter interaction, we have the X-ray photon that just sails through an atom and it doesn't hit any of the, the um, electrons in the orbits. It just sails through, it passes through with no interaction. And this is what's gonna produce your dark areas on the film or the radiolucent areas on the film. So soft tissue, the pulp, ligament space, that's what you're gonna get your dark air spaces. Did I skip one? No, I didn't. Um, secondary radiation absorbs completely, um, ab when it's absorbed completely, like when it comes in contact and it just totally is 100% used up, 
We call that the photoelectric effect. And it transfers all of its energy from the X-ray photon, so from what's in, coming out of the primary beam, to the atom of whatever it hit. So it just uses gives all of its energy to that. Um, and then, and that counts for about 30% of the reactions of that um, happen between the X-ray photon and matter is the photoelectric effect. And this produces the white or the light area. So this is your amalgams, your bone, um, any area that's whiter on an X-ray. And then you have your shades of gray, which is just kind of a um, combination of different things. So this is showing photoelectric effect, your X-ray photon coming into the atom and then coming in contact with a, um, an electron and just being completely absorbed, giving up all of its energy. So there's two different types of scatter radiation that you have to memorize. We have Compton scatter, um, photo, the photon strikes a loosely bound. So this kind of will remind you of the characteristic Bremsphalon. So we're talking about how it interacts with the atom. So the X-ray photon strikes a loosely bound outer shell electron of matter and ejects it from the orbit. And that causes ionization because it's kicking out an electron. So this is loosely bound. So it's going to be an outer. Remember, K shell is close and tightly bound. The outer ones are more loosely bound. So an Mm -hmm. So, yep, it's one of the ones that are farther out. So an X-ray photon collides with a loosely bound outer shell electron, gives up part of its energy to eject the electron from its orbit. The X-ray photon loses energy, but it, it can still continue on in a different direction. So it scatters. So it can do the same thing somewhere else um, and until it gets absorbed. If Compton scatter reaches the film after it's done this, it's what kind of results in it can cause a little bit of a fog to the film. So it can de it decreases your quality of your film the way it looks if you have too much scatter. Yeah. So this is, so now it's hit the anode. It's now an X-ray photon. It's traveled through the BID and now it's hit the patient. And this happens with, the, with an interaction with the patient. Yes, a patient's atom. Yep. Approximately 62% of the interactions with matter is Compton scatter. Here's a, an image of Compton. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. It could, it could, but, or it could just be absorbed in you mm -hmm. and, and, and cause some cellular interaction if you're in the room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Compton scatter, so it um, kicks off the electron and then it can keep going to do it again. Coherent is the one that happens the most infrequently. Coherent, so Compton happens 62%, let's say, 68% um, of the time. So Compton happens the most often. Oh, was it 62%? Okay, 62 for Compton. Coherent is 8%, so this happens the least amount. Um, coherent scatter, low energy photons, ha um, has its path altered by matter and changes direction. Um, X-ray photons undergo change without direct change in direction without change in energy. So that's a low energy X-ray photon. So that's the stuff that we're trying to filter out, but there's still going to be some variation. But it comes in um, and it and it still has this interaction, but it pretty much just kind of goes through the atom and then keeps going. X-ray photon undergoes change in direction without change in energy. So it it might go and do this, but then it might the next time it hits another atom, it might be absorbed or come in or knock something out, and then you know. So they it kind of can change what it's doing, but that's if it goes in and doesn't do really much of anything at all, just changes direction. Um, attenuation um, is. So the reduction in the intensity of the X-ray beam as it traverses dental tissue. So I like this image because it kind of shows um, how we have our source of our X-ray, we have our primary beam, and then if we hit bone, then we're gonna, so see how the primary beam is like this blue? If we hit bo bone, then we it is absorbed in the bone and then we end up with um, a darker area over here, I mean, a lighter area over here because it's absorbed most of the X-ray photons. 
um, this is a different type of bone, maybe not as dense of a bone. And so it's not gonna be quite as white. And then we have air and it's gonna pass through and it's gonna reach the, um, it's gonna reach the receptor and it's gonna leave a dark area. So it's gonna expose the receptor even more and leave a dark area. So high absorption of X-ray photons equals a radiopaque area, high absorption. So high absorption into this bone, um, leaving not a lot of X-ray photons to do anything on the film. Less dense bone, it's absorbing, but not as much as this denser bone. So there's some more X-ray photons available to expose on the film, but not, still not as many. And then if it's going through air or gingiva, it has lots of X-ray photons that can still have the capacity to reach the sensor. Um, and it will make these radiolucent areas or the dark areas. I still have three slides and I'm running out of time. I'm like done, I think. I am done. So um, this is just talking. The last three are basically showing some images of how the electron will go through. This is a cross section of a tooth and showing how it will um, be lighter or dark. Oh, sorry, you guys. Um, a cross section of a tooth and how it will be lighter or darker on the film. And this is just showing the different densities and then how, and then in real life, what it looks like. And um, this is also talking about things like the density of the patient, the dent, the atomic number of the material, all of those things can, um, will affect how it shows up on the actual film. And time did not allow, but those were some questions. So come up here and grab one of these. And then this is just stuff of um, for you guys to um, help you memorize some of the different parts of that. And then you're, we're done for the day.